All right, today we are going to go through a bunch of notes. Uh, a lot of things are going to look really familiar to you. Uh, so uh, there are three sheets right now that we're going to go. If you're not sure about the order, there's a little post-it note in the upper right, and you can kind of deduce uh, the order based off of that, I hope. Okay, so uh, about half of this is probably a uh, good review. The other half will be things that we are going to be adding as we go throughout Okay, so I'm going to get right into it today. Uh, we left off yesterday talking about electromagnetic spectrum, talking about how we can get energy out of that, so we need to just elaborate on that a little bit more. Okay, so uh, you're responsible this year to know exactly where everything is. It's not necessarily the specific values within here, but you should be able to tell me uh, as much as possible. So what is the furthest uh, radiation to the left? It's gamma. We're going to fill this all in. And this is not awesome. Hold on. Let's try that again. That's better. And I'm going to manipulate this a little bit so that we can actually get it. Okay. Gamma's right there. What was next? Without trying to look. X-ray, X-ray is 10 to the negative 10th meters. This is all based on wavelength. Okay. Now, some people get this next one confused between two different ones. Is it ultraviolet or is it infrared? So I gave away that right away. So I'm going to jump down here first. I want to talk about the colors. And I know that yours doesn't have colors on it. Um, if you want to add that, that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, but uh, we talked a lot about the fact that you've been lied to uh, about the rainbow all these years. It's not the famous scientist Roy G. Bibb that discovered the rainbow. It's his alter ego, Vib G. Roar. Uh, so I would actually write that underneath, though, and kind of spread it out. And the reason why I talk about that is that will keep track of your ultraviolet and your infrared. Because after violet, or before, depending on your direction, is ultraviolet. And it's not just red, it's infrared. There is something though, number wise, there's one thing you do have to have down and it's not all four of these, it's the range, okay? So I do believe I have the four times 10 to the negative seventh and the seven times 10 to the negative seventh, but that's not the way we see colors. The way the colors are given to us are in the hundreds and in nanometers. So seven times, or sorry, four times 10 to negative seven would be 400 nanometers, and then so on and so forth. So you are responsible. We'll talk about how we're gonna try to remember that. We need to know in general the four to 700 range. It's not that bad. Um, and then these other two are not necessarily numbers that you would have to come up with. Because if you're like, well, is that blue? Is it green? Is it yellow? Is it orange? It's, it's kind of a yellowish orange. It's kind of a, a bluish green. Um, but how I just remember this always is that this is wavelength, and in meters it gets larger. Okay, the smallest waves are this way, the largest waves are that way. Uh, anybody remember? There's only a couple left. Without trying to look. Hmm? The radio, yep, yeah, we'll put radio. Radio is over here. And I just heard micro. Micro is right here. And we'll do TV and radio. So there I am. And if, I mean, it's not a big deal, but these kind of do have barriers. They're not exact. I'm not writing, I mean, if you're like, where is that exactly? Uh, I know that negative 12 is gamma, negative 10 is x-ray. Uh, just the round negative 8 is UV, around negative 4, round negative 2. Uh, I'm not expecting that you know that. Can you read a spectrum and interpret? Okay. So how are we going to do that? A couple quick things that we have, and we talked about this all yesterday, but we're just going to make sure we have it all down. So I'm going to fly through this a little faster than if you had just learned it, obviously. But that is wavelength. Very important. Always will be in meters, right? Always. This is the best symbol I could come up with on Word. That is our new, uh, that is frequency, right? And that's going to be hertz. Seconds. It's the same unit. And what does that all fall into then? 
very important equation. Um, I, I always just add this because I just want you to be aware of. This is number of waves per second. That's what that means. That's why the unit is the way it is. If it's ever just discussing something, it's always important to have an idea down. Um, you know, you never know. With that as well, uh, oh, where should I write this? Just a couple prefixes I think you should really know. And these are the way that you're going to see them. We talked about it yesterday. Right? It's kind of nice to just have it all in one foul swoop. So this is 10 to the negative 9, right? This is 10 to the, what's kilo? 10 to the third. I should see those. Like, in my mind, I should be able to look at the metric system in my head and be like, all right, I know it's kilo, mega, giga. Like, you should have those three down. And they're every third. So this is the third, this is to the sixth. Those are going to come up. So this is going to come up a lot in your wavelength. These are going to come up a lot in your frequencies because uh, radio stations, uh, that's, that's just the frequency that they're at. So it's very applicable for us. Okay. Uh, a couple other quick little things that we can jot that it's important to know. Make a line that tries to cut. I think it might actually be on the line that you have. I tried to make it look like notebook paper. I don't know if it came out very well. Uh, that a wave is actually split in half like that. Uh, and there's a bunch of stuff that we can label. And I'm just looking at my notes because I want to make sure that um, uh, we are getting everything that we need. So if you are in physics, I never want to take the thunder away from Mr. Blackford. There is a cool uh, lab that, or a demo that you can do and you attach a string to a amplifier, basically speaker, and then you put a weight at the other end. I don't know if you guys have seen this before. And then you have a strobe light that you can manipulate. And if the waves... We, uh, going at a certain frequency, and you get the fr uh, strobe light to go at a certain frequency, it literally freezes the wave, and then you can slowly in the dark make it move, and you can see a lot of different things of the waves. It's pretty cool. Uh, so these are nodes. Nodes kind of like the absence of movement. Nodes tell us a lot about electrons, because electrons are moving in waves, so actually where the nodes are are like where the absence of electrons are going to be which is kind of a huge deal uh, for us. Um, gosh, there's a lot. I mean, like, look at, this is the crest. This is the trough. I've also heard of a peak. So we could call it a peak. I have heard trough is a valley. And then lastly, a lot of stuff. Right. But, That is the amplitude. Hopefully you can read that. And that's either the height, amplitude. Height of a wave or the depth or height of a crest or depth of a trough. It's the same thing. So you could do um, either one. Uh, last little thing that I can just label, you can do it either way, how wherever you can fit this. It's either three nodes or a crest to crest or trough to trough. That is a wavelength. If you can just fit it right on top, that's great. Here's another one right here. That's the length of a wave, right? You gotta have one crest and one trough to complete a wave. So like I have a bunch. Oh, we should We should have that down, but it's 3.0 <coughs> times 78. So I have some waves on the right, and it uh, is all in one second. They all occur in one second, so it's talking about frequency. Right, waves, the, the, the faster, or the, sorry, the more frequent a wave can uh, occur in a second, what happens to the wavelength? It shrinks, right? So. If one's large, the other one has to be small. We could count all these up and see how many waves we actually have. We definitely do that, but you can definitely see that you have a lot more waves. This one has four waves, eight waves, 16 waves, all in one second. So um, as it's going, you can see that the, um, the frequency is going greater as the wavelength is getting smaller. So where does this all come from? 
some of this stuff's really important. Some of it's just, uh, well, it's all important, but it's interesting to kind of go back. Uh, some of these names will come up, so we kind of need to know. So I thought this was kind of a, an easy way, a uh, nice little flow chart that we can make. So uh, we're going to learn about three scientists quickly. Uh, the first one, you've heard his last name before. Max Planck. I have heard Planck as well. Okay. So he was dealing with a certain equation, which was this. Kind of what he contributed, one of the things. The change in energy <coughs> equals h times nu. Well, what's that all about? This is probably the heaviest part of the notes. Talk about it. So everything emits energy. Okay, everything is emitting energy, but it's like kind of talked about this yesterday. You're at a coffee shop and you have these little packets of sweet and low. It has a certain amount of whatever the heck sweet and low really is. <laughs> that is how much you're going to add to the coffee every single time, right? Usually people don't open it up and put half of it in there. There's a certain set amount that will be released. Well. If an object only released energy in huge surges, you'd literally see like Ferraris like going down the street in these big surges of energy. When we're moving, we'd be all jagged and, and choppy because we, we would be moving uh, in, in these very specific amounts of energy. So it's kind of the difference between going up steps, which kind of have increments, versus going up this nice ramp. Because Planck found out that these pockets are packets, packets, Packets of energy are so tiny that everything looks so fluid. So when you look at the equation, what it really is, it's the, the size of these packets times how often they occur, which is frequency. And by having that relationship, you have how much energy actually exists. So it's how often these packets of energy occur. And there's a show when I was a kid, it was an awesome show. It's called Quantum Leap. And this guy, would he was a scientist, and it might not be much in the future any longer, but he was in the future, and he went back in the time, and he, and he would always get this glow, blue glow of light, and he would jump, because electrons jump when they gain energy. He would jump from one uh, person to another in the past, and he would change what went wrong, and he made it right. And then once he fixed their lives, he would get all blue, and he would jump again. It was a good show, good show. It was an everyone show in the nation for a long time but it comes from this quantum and they leap so anyway so taking that all three of these are going to contribute to what we're doing today uh, you might have heard this guy before his name's albert einstein i know exactly quanta yes albert einstein my favorite thing to still think about it's it's silly and it's small but when someone does something dumb with all the things that einstein has contributed uh when you do something really idiotic or Foolish, your, your friends or someone who knows you sometimes will be like, nice move, Einstein. Be like, that's, that's how his name is used the most often in everyday life is when someone does something bone heavy. Like that is great. You might have heard this one. E equals MC squared. I have, oh shoot, I should show it to you. Uh, I'm not going to find it in time. I uh, found a funny comic. Einstein's sitting at his desk, and I think his wife is like helping clean. Uh, or no, Einstein. <laughs> that's it. Einstein's on the board, and he's got e equals m c three e, uh, cubed e equals m c to the seven. He's got all these numbers, and then his uh, his wife is like, "There you go. Everything on your desk is nice and squared. That's right, R nice and squared." And he hasn't figured out this m c squared. So that's funny. Ha <laughs> ha. All right. So what he's going to contribute to what we need to know is that radiation itself, and this is, this is where physics and chemistry really start to blend a lot, more physics probably. Bless you. That he realized that all radiation, when I say radiation, you don't have to be thinking about only things that are dangerous. The, the entire electromagnetic spectrum is radiation. 
Radiation itself is really a stream of particles called photons. Where things started to really change is when scientists started realizing that light and other types of phenomenon were also particles. And they behave like particles, but they also behave like light. And that's where I'm about to get into the last one. We've got to connect all this together. So I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here. But the last scientist that we'll discuss, he's French. I'm sorry, my spelling is not, does not look right. There we go. Louis de Bruglé. And I, that's about as much French I, as I know. Actually, I do know some more French. But you may not understand it, so sorry if you don't. But it's ha, ha, ha. It means a lot. It can actually be used in a lot of different situations. So I, I, I just don't want to elaborate on it now. But, uh, What do you call somebody who knows two languages? Bilingual. Bilingual. What do you call somebody who knows one language? An American. So, okay, this is confusing and unfortunately we won't be able to get into enough of this and it's not going to affect you in the long term here, but you're going to run into it. A lot of you will be taking a lot of different courses in your lifetime. So every time you hear it, it's just going to help. Um, matter acts both like particle, like particle-like characteristics and wave-like. What the heck does that mean? Particles are like, think of billiard balls. Like they have mass. They can uh, deflect. They run into each other. All that stuff, right? They, they have collisions. Waves have a certain amount of energy. They, they move at a certain uh, speed. Um, We'll learn later, but the waves have to connect in a certain way. Um, we have wavelengths and frequencies. So they actually have this dual property, which <laughs> kind of opened the door for physics in general uh, back in the middle uh, 20th century. Uh, but uh, De Bruglé's uh, equation, it's going to be kind of hard to see, but we're going to write it right here. It's wavelength equals H over M. And this is a V now, not a nu. And you don't have to stress out too much. We're going to be able to see the difference. So we're going to take all of them and put them down below. It's probably the slowest part of today. Um, oh, that's where I had the constant. I didn't need to rewrite that. So before we do that, we should just, I knew I had it written somewhere else. These are going to be the two constants that you're going to be provided with. It's nothing that you have to memorize. It should be on your orange sheet. I'd be shocked if something has changed that much. Um, I had forgotten to look at it, but it is always a bit better. So you have speed of light and you have Planck's constant. And those just need to be utilized when you uh, feel like they are needed. Okay, so what I'm about to show you is not, the flow chart is not something that you have to technically be responsible for, but it is interesting to see at least where it all comes from, okay? So follow along with me. We're going to use the relationship of wavelengths and frequencies that they always are traveling at the speed of light, which is all radiation, okay? If we break that up, not break that up, but rearrange. Do that better. It's still the same equation. So this first part you have seen. We did this yesterday. So you take that equation, you take the energy equation that deals with Planck's constant and h times uh, nu, which is frequency. And what we can do is we can combine those two, right? You can take out the frequency and you can plug in c over lambda. That is one you are going to be responsible for. You should have that one. Now, so that one's, that one's great. That one's really important. But if we take Einstein's equation, and you have them equal each other, so what is Einstein's equation bringing, into the, uh, bringing to the table? He's bringing mass. He's bringing mass <laughs> to the table. Okay, and if you rearrange that and you're talking about units, OK, 
Okay, so frequency, for example, like this has seconds in it, and mass, is, mass over seconds is a velocity. What you end up doing is get, getting De Bruglet's equation, which is this one. So this is a very new equation for us. And let me just show you, this is kind of how some people write it. You put a little flag at the end, and it, it's your call. But if you're not very clear on your frequency versus your, your velocity, then you're going to make a mistake. This is velocity. which is meters per second. Okay, so what this does, this shows that with anything with mass and velocity, it has a corresponding It has a corresponding wavelength. Okay, if we're going to be talking about that, we're going to be looking at that. So if you have, uh, if you have mass and you have velocity, uh, then you are going to have a wavelength. Well, wait, it might be a particle. Exactly, it has a dual nature. So we can talk about it in terms of wavelengths and frequencies. We can talk about it also in terms of mass and velocity. All right. So that being said, we're going to just quickly pump out three problems. I already have them written there for you. Uh, we'll see how this works. And then uh, we'll kind of jump to the next ones uh, and the next pages kind of get into some just specifics of uh, a couple other equations that we have and we'll see where we're at when we're all done. Okay, so first one, just what is the frequency of green light? This is kind of like the one on your review sheet. Uh, so I want frequency. If it ever asked about a radiation of any kind, like any kind of radiation, and I know we don't think about light like radiation, but if it's on the electromagnetic spectrum, it's radiation. What am I finding then? Or what, I, what do I have, I should say? Or what does that give me, better question? Like what variable, what am I using? The wavelength. You gotta keep that... it being on the hook. So radiation, you got to remember that this is wavelength, always wavelength. And if it's given you in another way, that's fine. You know what? Actually up here, let's just do this quickly. Somewhere. Which way, don't, wait. Which way does energy increase? Let's, let's have a, this way, right? Let's just have a, I already have wavelength that way. What about frequency? Think about it. Why do I know it's this way? What's the thing that tells me that? Because wavelength gets bigger that way. They're opposites. So frequency and uh, energy, bless you, get larger going that way. You might just want to, like that's important to have because you can simplify things really quickly for yourself. All right, so here we go. Pump this out. This gives me a uh, wavelength. And I just, I didn't even mean to do green. This is, this is awesome. So I pump it, uh, just put it out. I will do a lot of the math for you. I just want you to have some uh, strong examples that it would have. What am I going to write for the wavelength? Approximately. About 500. Let's, let's not worry too much. 500 times 10 to the negative ninth, or you could have um, done 5 times 10 to the negative seventh, correct? Okay. And then when you're all said and done, I got you on this. What's my unit? Hertz or inverse seconds, right? Or one over seconds, something like that. Be mindful, every color of the frequency is times 10 to the negative 14-ish. Okay, second one. Uh, calculate the wavelength of a photon that has a velocity. You might want to just underline the word velocity. And a mass. What is the type of wavelength for this? Okay, let's just talk about this for a second. This is important. Remember, joules is kilograms oh boy, meters squared over seconds squared. Why am I writing that? Well, because this is velocity, so here I am. 
And what unit is in H? I have it right here. Joules. Whenever joules are present, I need kilograms. It's the one time. So that's why, I mean, I, it was destiny that I had the Van Vredy story. So I keep trying to tell you. So I run into him and they talk about joules. And it was embarrassing, but it has a hidden meaning in it. So um, I need to do this equation. Okay, and I'm just going to write it below, Let's set it up quickly. And I don't want to spend too much time on this because I think I'm, I'm very confident that you guys are able to manipulate equations at this point. If you are strong at understanding in general uh, what units should be there, you don't have to worry about crossing things out and worrying about all of that because I'm at wavelength, so my unit would be meters. Done. If you have an understanding of each variable, you have so much less you have to worry about. Now it says what type of wave this is. So that's important also. It says what type. So when it says type at this wavelength, well, even if it just said type, that would be a wavelength. Because that's my, my source. My source is the electromagnetic spectrum, and the electromagnetic spectrum is based off of a wavelength. So that would make sense to me. So if I calculate that all out again today, right now, I, I got you on writing these out. What type of wave is that? Approximately. Looks like x-ray, right? Done. X-ray. Negative 10, right? You're looking at the negative 10 part. Not the one point, whatever I wrote. 1.33. So this is x ray. And I'm good to go. A lot of people forget to write the actual type, which is a big problem. All right, last quick one, and we got to get to the next page here. Calculate the energy associated with pure red light. Please just set that up. I will do the math for you. Can you set it up? Can you get it into the equation you need? What equation can you put in the numbers? Give you about 30 seconds. Like what? At least get, figure out what equation you think you're using. And I only want one equation. What equation could you use? You got them all above you. So what is the energy associated with pure red light? What would I be using? Hope you came up with that equation. Why red light is the wavelength. I'm looking for energy. Do all that. Anybody else? 2.83? Something like that. 19, negative 19. Is that close? Close enough? What is my unit? Um, joules. joules. It's an energy, right? Joules. Now, if you get stuck, you can always look through, but you know, cancel things out. How do I, great question. How did I get a great blink? It says pure red light, so I got it from right here. Okay. And that is the one range. You will have to know perp violet to red. You will have to know violet is 400 and red is 700. That, those, you don't have to know the rest, but you should know those two numbers. I'm not making memorize these either, but you do need to know these. I think it's an important range to know. Now you're gonna see different sources. Hey, this one says 750. Yeah, there's different ranges that people have, but in general. Okay, so that is some stuff that kind of uh, backs up yesterday. Let's keep moving here. Uh, so some of this you know, this one, this page isn't going to take nearly as much time. I hope we have things to get done. 
Okay, last year, and uh, tomorrow I'll show you a little bit, just don't have time to do this all at once, and wanted to get the bulk of this out today so we can kind of relate it. Uh, do you remember those emission tubes we had in large group, and depending on what year you took chem, it might not have been in large group then, but you had these tubes, and then you look through uh, either goggles or a, a little square, and then you saw lines on the side. Those lines are showing a, a specific amount of energy uh, associated with a specific wavelength, and what it does is it proves to us that electrons are jumping and falling from very specific levels because they're emitting very specific colors, like very specific colors. So for example, um, I can't read this one. That looks, it doesn't look like hydrogen because of that color, right? Unless that's supposed to be red. This probably is the hydrogen. Um, but it comes through the slit, breaks down into just the colors that there are. So there's a couple just really important terms that you need to know. Uh, they probably make a lot of sense as you hear them, but when we're talking about electrons jumping and falling, so that's what I need you to understand. Electron sitting here, energy comes in, hits it, causes the electron to get excited, it jumps, and then when it falls, uh, it releases that energy. So the ground state is the lowest energy state. And an excited state is when, I know this may seem like it's a little overkill, but it's when an atom has a higher potential energy than the ground state. So usually that, that is where electrons are uh, when electrons jump, it's usually my excited state. They're, they're jumping. It is important, though, because problems will actually refer to, like, uh, write the electron configuration in the ground state. Okay, that's, that's the lowest uh, electrons, so that's where they just would fall in. Anything else, we don't really know. That's the problem. Like, you say excited state, you've got to tell me more information. I can't be like, oh, okay, I'll just start writing that, because I know where they jumped. Like, I don't know where they jumped. All we know is where they're resting or the lowest energy possible and that is a big difference um, we're limited we, we always got to realize that we only know as much as unfortunately we know I know that sounds very profound um, Niels Bohr next one Let's talk about him a little bit what he brought to the table and did I just misspell his name <coughs> feel like I just misspelled his name Yep, sorry, not a big deal. Not like that's gonna really be a big deal. Okay, this is what I wanna talk about, is right here. So, because electrons fall, you can't see it on yours, but by falling a certain amount, it, it correlates to a very specific energy. So I kinda have uh, the pictures here. Here are some terms that you might see. So here's just a nice image. It says energy absorption. What that means is that the electron is absorbing energy. So this is where the excited, part comes into play, okay? Then, this energy right here says light emission. You can't see that there's an arrow at the end. Okay, what it's doing is this is releasing the energy. And because of that, it emits a photon. And this, an eyeball. That's literally what we're seeing. When it falls, if we can, obviously. Like, oh my gosh, that x-ray looks so pretty. As your eye just starts to break down. Thanks. He's got, they have blue eyes. Blue eyes. I would have done a couple things differently if I could we do that, but I'm gonna leave it. All right, so what we are gonna be able to do, unfortunately only for one element, we're actually gonna be able this year talk about uh, how much energy actually is uh, present by jumping or falling a certain amount of, of levels. So here we go. You're not, you might be able to fit all this in, I cannot. So you might wanna just wait and see because there's a lot written here.
kind of left space. I should have made it just a bigger, a bigger box. That would have made sense. So, okay. Hopefully I'll be able to show you what this equation looks like. It's gonna make a lot more sense in a second. We can only do it for hydrogen. After that, it's way too complicated. It does not apply, but in theory, it, it, it could, but it doesn't. So let me just show you what I'm looking at here. These numbers here on the top are the atomic number, hence why it's a one, because it's hydrogen. So in theory, if you were dealing with like neon, it, it would be a 10 on top, but we're not really doing that. Does anybody know what N stands for whenever you're talking about electrons and it's not moles? We're gonna relearn it today, but we kind of talked about it once in a while. Like on the periodic table, we write like N minus one sometimes, for like the P block. It's a very universal use of it. Unfortunately, I know Ns can be used in different ways. Whenever you see an N and it's not in PV equals NRT, not in PV equals NRT, it's an energy level. Okay, so <coughs> I want to do two problems to show you how the heck to use this. And it'll make a lot more sense right away. Okay, so example one. Calculate the energy required to move the hydrogen electron from the first to the second energy level. That's what that would mean. Okay. Find the wavelength of radiation that had, been, or had to be absorbed by the electron. So I am moving that electron from the first to the second. I'm moving it up. Okay? That means I've got to put energy in. It's got to jump. It's got to jump up. So how do I do that? By doing this. Plug in the equation. I'll do a different color. I don't think you can see that. Oh, come on, just hit it. So I'm using this value, and I will explain what that value is once it reveals itself here. Okay, and then it's still final minus initial. I'm ending at the second, I'm starting at the first. So what that would look like, Just like that. I'll be your calculator today. That would be your energy. Technically, that's not asking or answering the question. Um, or maybe it is. I'm sorry. Find the wavelength. Oh. That's how much energy it would take. And then I'm not going to finish this up, but what would I do? If I have energy, I would take, I'll come back. I would take this equation, plug in my energy. I can find wavelength. So all we're going to do for today, this will just be good notes for you, but is you can rearrange that and do that and just plug it in. Right? Plug it in the energy. Actually, I don't want to confuse you. This will go down there. And then I would find wavelength. Technically, is what the final question asks. Okay. The equation is probably still is confusing to you, so I want to show you the next one kind of reveals what this is all about. It says, oh, calculate the energy required to remove the electron from the hydrogen atom in the ground state. So literally, I have an atom here, and I want to remove it. Like, I want to take it out completely. <coughs> How much energy would that take? Remember, there is a force. There is an attractive force between the nucleus and my electron. I have to overcome that. So let's talk about that. Last one up here. You think you're going to have to memorize this equation? Yes. No. When do we have to memorize equations in here? Never. Hardly ever. Uh, I think M MCAT was on the orange sheet. Was it? Yes. Yeah, it was. Nice. Yes. Well, I said it was good. If you had to look up MCAT every time you did a problem, you'd be in a lot of trouble. Okay, uh, so where are you re uh, removing it from? You are removing it from the first ground, 
first level. Why do I know that? Because uh, hydrogen has one energy level. Where am I removing it to? No, zero. No, not zero. I'm not, I'm not shoving it into the nucleus. I'm removing it out. So like there's all these levels. So basically I'm doing this. Now you're starting like my son, like uh, infinity squared or infinity times infinity. Okay. What does that basically become? One over infinity minus one squared. What is this number basically going to be? It's going to be basically zero, isn't it? But more or less, right? One over the largest number you can think of squared. So basically, this is negative one. Basically negative one. So I don't know if this is going to make sense to you or not. Basically, what then occurs is from this equation, it's stating that that is the amount of energy it actually takes to release a electron from hydrogen. If you look, the last answer is smaller. Anything less, if you don't remove it completely, you take uh, you take a look at each of those energy levels, it will be less energy. So this is the maximum amount of energy that it would take to completely remove it. If I'm not completely removing it, then it will be a little less than that. So that's where that number comes from. They figured out that's the amount of energy it takes to remove an actual um, electron from hydrogen. Okay? So uh, that being said, we're going to learn about two more names here for sure. I have one more quick YouTube video to show you. We got, we got a lot of things to do. So uh, these two guys doing some math that only a few people in the world do, did, did. First one, Schrodinger. He's got the umlauts. No. My name used to have umlauts a long time ago. You used to have umlauts, so this is where this all originated. So then I'm like, well, what if I put a tilde on here and an accent on there? And it becomes Gus Sway. Gus Sway, by not, mis by not having to do anything with spelling. But let's not put my name next to somebody who's done so much. That's, that's uh, disrespectful to Schrodinger, <laughs> to be totally honest. So Schrodinger, <laughs> it really is. <laughs> what is Schrodinger bringing to the table right now? It's about electrons. It is about energy levels. If you just look at this, what Schrodinger, he did a lot of physics. What he figured out, again, math that only a few people in the world probably can handle, is that why we talk about particles and mass behaving both like particles and waves is because these electrons are floating around the nucleus, not like these circles, okay, and not like exactly on a line, but in wave form. So check it out, like this matches up. This matches up. As you add more waves, you are further away. If you have more waves, you probably have more energy. But it cannot mismatch. It can't all of a sudden like, not match up and not be a consistent uh, wave. So that means that you're in between energy levels. So energy levels are actually more determined by the frequency, the energy, and the wavelength of the electrons moving around the nucleus, which is just much more information that you've ever probably been given about energy levels and what an atom really is and, and how it is structured. Schrodinger also brought something kind of now funny, but it was really real. You talked about uh, the knowledge of knowing if something's actually present or not. I'm going to butcher this no matter what, but if you've heard about the Schrodinger's cat, it's the idea that you have a cat inside of this box and there's this vial. And if you open the box, you kill the cat. It releases the, the cyanide right away. You can't shake it either because it'll kill the cat immediately. But the question is, is the cat alive or is it already dead? And the fact that the duality of not knowing for certain if it is alive or dead and you're unable to check it basically inhibits some knowledge that you may have about certain parts of the physical world. So I will let my friend Sheldon Cooper explain this a lot better than I will. I guess you're aware that Leonard asked me out. 
Well, he didn't actually say anything, but when he came back to the apartment, he was doing a dance that brought to mind the happy hippos in Fantasia. Oh, that's nice. Anyhow, the thing I wanted to talk to you about is, you know, since Leonard and I have become friends, I was just... Want to sit down? Oh, I wish it were that simple. <laughs> See, I don't spend much time here, and so I've never really chosen a place to sit. Well, choose. I mean, I, there are a number of options, and I'm really not familiar enough with the cushion densities, airflow patterns, and dispersion of sunlight to make an informed choice. All right, why don't you just pick one at random, and then if you don't like it, you can sit somewhere else next time. No, no, that's crazy. <laughs> you go ahead and talk while I figure it out. Okay. Um, here's the thing. So I've known for a while now that Leonard has had a little crush on me. A little crush? Well, I suppose so. In the same way Menelaus had a little crush on Helen of Troy. All right, yeah, I don't really know who they are. Well, Menelaus you... was the brother of Agamemnon. Yeah, I don't care, I don't care. Listen, the point is, Leonard isn't the kind of guy I usually yeah, go I didn't know there was this much bleed in. the kind of guy anyone usually goes out with. <laughs> Would you be open to rotating the couch clockwise 30 degrees? No. What I'm saying is, Leonard might be different in a good way. Obviously, my usual choices have not worked out so well. The last one worked out well for Cooper Polly. He got a free iPod. <laughs> oh, glare. But on the other hand, if things don't go well with Leonard, I risk losing a really good friend. I mean, I'm guessing he's not looking for a fling. He's the kind of guy that gets into a relationship for, I don't know, like you would say, light years. I would not say that. <laughs> no one would say that. A light year is a unit of distance, not time. Thank you for the clarification. <laughs> Draft. You see, people hear the word year and they think duration. A foot pound has the same problem. That's a unit of work, not of weight. Right, thanks. Mm, it's a common mistake. Not the first one I've made today. <laughs> okay. I think this will be my seat. Sheldon, do you have anything to say that has anything to do with, you know, what I'm talking about? Well, let's see. We might consider Schrodinger's cat. Schrodinger? Is that the woman in 2A? No, that's Mrs. Grossinger. And she doesn't have a cat. She has a Mexican hairless, annoying little animal. You can't Sheldon! <laughs> Sorry, you diverted me. Anyway, in 1935, Erwin Schrodinger, in an attempt to explain the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, he proposed an experiment where a cat is placed in a box with a sealed vial of poison that will break open at a random time. Now, since no one knows when or if the poison has been released, until the box is opened, the cat can be thought of as both alive and dead. I'm sorry, I don't get the point. Well, of course you don't get it. I haven't made it yet. <laughs> you have to be psychic to get it, and there's no such thing as psychic. Sheldon, what's the point? Just like Schrodinger's cat, your potential relationship with Leonard right now can be thought of as both good and bad. It is only by opening the box that you'll find out which it is. Okay, so you're saying I should go out with Leonard? No, 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 no. <laughs> Let me start again. In 1935... <laughs> Breaking Bad, that's where this comes from, but again, he was there first. Heisenberg, what he did is he came up with the uncertainty principle, and this one uh, we apply a lot in these kinds of concepts. So let me write it down and then we'll see where we're at. Sorry if I'm in the way. This is the thing. 
back in the day, people started saying, hey, we know exactly where electrons are. They're on these energy levels, and they're right here. And then people started to realize, you know what? We don't know as much as we think we know. And Heisberg came along, and his uncertainty principle is basically this. And I hope this kind of makes sense. You can either know where it is or how fast it's going. Whenever you witness or interact or observe something, they say, in theory, you have now altered it. Regardless. Well, yeah, but you're, I'm from a distance. Because of your presence, you have altered it, and you have now changed it in some way. So if I locate where the electron is, by doing that, I'm probably, there's, there's no way that I know exactly how fast it's going because of the fact that I know exactly where it is. I can't know how fast it's going and know where that is. If I try to track and know how fast it's going, I'll never know exactly where it is. I can't know both at the same time. And that's what Heisenberg kind of brings to the table. We will talk about quantum numbers and things like that, but I want to do a problem for you to get you started. So if you want to go to the back of your uh, atomic structure uh, two, I'm going to do about two and a half more minutes yet here. So we, we might hit just at the time. We're going to skip the third note sheet for right now because all the third note sheet does is talk about, so it's on the back of atomic structure so you got a worksheet, or time structure one, I'm sorry. In the back of time structure one, it should have this right here. We're going to do one of them right now. We're going to do letter D. Okay, everybody find this? Okay, we don't have a lot of time to do this. Quantum numbers. If you don't remember this, I, I expect everyone to be uh, rock stars at this very shortly, okay? So, what we do um, is we need four numbers. They are an address for electrons. So if I want to find this uh, <coughs> electron, last year I did this whole example with a panda and a panda party and trying to find the, the party on a street. So if I want to get more specific as I go, the first one I can say, you don't write all this, is I can say I'm on the third energy level, right? So I would put a three. And I'm not going to put any other notes right now. If you want to, that's fine, but that's the energy level. Then I'm on the energy level. Now I need to tell the reader which one am I on, right? So I'm on the D. Do you guys remember what number I give that? Off the top of your head? It's okay if you don't. The trick is the, the S. The S is zero, because these are quantum numbers. So if you remember the S is zero, then D would be a two. Okay? There's, a, there's an order and a system to that. It's the only one that it, it, it looks like a letter, but it's actually a number. Then, I'm on here now. So now I need to tell the reader or myself where it is. I can't be like, oh, it's the third from the right. So anybody remember the trick on that? We assign the middle a zero, and then we count outwards. So this would be plus one, plus two, minus one, minus two. So I'm on one, or plus one. Does that make sense? I'm one away from the middle. If I was over here, this would be negative one. And then lastly, it's the spin. I'm literally on this orbital now, is it going up or is it going down? They offset each other, so it's going to equal one total, so they're each a half. In this case, I am pointing the one that's pointing up. I know it's kind of hard to read. So I do a plus one half. If it was pointing down, it'd be a negative one half. Okay? Don't worry about the big packet. Uh, we will talk about that tomorrow. I gave it to you a day early, and you will be getting only one day late. It's not a large write-up. We're not doing the lab until next week anyway. You'll be getting your zombie outbreak. Uh, pre-lab tomorrow because we are playing around with some chemicals and it did not work late yesterday so I, I want to make sure I have the right ones before I hand it out okay so work on that review the review is due tomorrow I believe the let, um, rating energy review so get that done and that'll be it for today <laughs>